Hey everyone, Mike from vSwitch Zero here. So yes, I know I should be working on part three of my daily 486 build series, but as you can see here, I got a little distracted once again. In my hands, I'm holding the legendary Gravis Ultrasound. So if you're into retro PC hardware at all, I'm sure you've probably noticed the price for these things has just skyrocketed in the last few years. I had been keeping an eye out for one for quite a while, but I mean, I just could never bring myself to pay the prices that these things are asking for you'd be really hard pressed to find a working one these days for less than 500 bucks. And I mean, usually they wind up on eBay for over a thousand. So um, I'm not gonna pay that kind of money. And unless you've got some really overwhelming nostalgic yearning for one of these things, I can't see anybody paying that kind of money to be honest. So after saying all that, how do I have one of these red unicorns of the audio world in my possession here? And you probably already guessed, it's totally broken and hey, at least it means I paid way less than I would have for a working card. But don't get me wrong, I still think I paid a bit too much for this thing, and I'm totally taking a gamble here because I don't know if I can get this thing fixed or not. But hey, it's at least worth a worth a shot. If I get a working gust out of it in the end, it'll be totally worth it. And hey, it'll probably be fun trying to fix it as well. So I'm not going to go too much into the history of the Gravis Ultrasound, or else this is going to get way too long, but... Unlike so many cards of the early to mid 90s, which were basically either just trying to clone, copy, or undercut Creative's famous Sound Blaster cards, Gravis decided to go basically a completely different direction with this thing. And it's not a Sound Blaster clone or even hardware compatible. And we're not just talking about digital audio, we're talking about FM synthesis as well. This thing has no FM chip on it whatsoever, so that means that it's you know, not even ad-lib compatible, which is pretty shocking for that time because so many games use them for music. And this brings about a whole bunch of challenges when it comes to game compatibility and stuff like that. But when you get software and games that were created specifically for the Gravis and took advantage of its unique hardware setup, and that's where the card really shines and that's why people love it so much. And although it has no way of doing hardware FM synthesis for MIDI, it's pretty much one of the first mainstream cards that you know did something really special and that's wavetable music. So rather than artificially simulating instruments uh, using FM, real recordings were basically loaded into the cards, onboard memory, and made MIDI music sound very realistic. And it was really completely different than what people were used to with FM and OPL3. So this card here that you can see is the original Gravis Ultrasound. Later on, people just basically called it the Ultrasound Classic when the newer models came out. But this one here is revision 3.7, which is actually one of the later revisions of the original card. And as you can see here, there's a total of eight uh, sockets for memory on this card. Most of these cards came with 256K like this one here. So right now it's just got a pair of NEC chips in it. But most of the Gus owners upgraded them to the maximum uh, one megabyte which wasn't very expensive to do. And you could still do quite a bit with a 256K card, but you really couldn't load a large number of wavetable samples or patches as they're often called, which means that things really didn't always sound the way they were supposed to. Certain games were really designed to use more than 256K. And if you were playing like a MIDI file with a lot of instruments, for example, they either just you know couldn't fit into the memory and they wouldn't play at all, or it would just sound really off. So that was kind of a, a problem too. But the, uh, the RAM in these things is very basic stuff, just the same sort of thing you'd find in video cards from around that time. Uh, in my case, the uh, seller actually did include a whole bunch of these uh, Oki or OKI chips. I'm not sure how to pronounce that. It's a little bit concerning that it's actually not in the card right now. So I'm not sure if they're not compatible or worse perhaps, but uh, I guess we'll cross that bridge uh, when we get there. So you'll notice here there's a socketed chip called the GF1. And this car, this uh, IC here was co-developed by Gravis and Forte Technologies. And it's basically a sample-based synthesis chip that makes all of the wavetable magic on this thing possible. So very important chip, but uh, it's actually also a common uh, source of failure on these cards. Quite a few of these chips go bad. So I'm hoping that's not gonna be the case here, but we'll have to uh, do some thorough testing on this thing. So this card's also uh, pre-PNP era, so there are jumpers to set the uh, base address down here. Uh, by default, it's 240, um, not like the uh, 220 that you usually see for sound blasters and stuff like that. Quite often, people will put these uh, in systems with a sound blaster, so that's maybe why they uh, set it to 240 instead of 220. But um, the IRQs for this are set with software initialization, and I'll talk more about the software situation for the, the Gus in a bit which I'll tell you right now is not the Gravis' strong point to say the very least, it's very frustrating, but we'll get more into that in a bit. 
On the uh, the I/O side of things, I mean, pretty standard ports on this thing. You've got uh, uh, mic and line in, and you've also got uh, amplified uh, speaker as well as uh, just standard non-amplified line out, which is great. And there's also a uh, game port here. I'm not sure if this does MPU 401. I'm assuming it does, but I'll I'll take a look at that later. Another interesting thing you'll see here is there's a very long uh, pin header that goes across just above the uh, ISA slot. If I'm not mistaken, these um, actually connect directly to the pins. There's just very small traces. So I think this actually allows you to put a recording um, daughter board on here. And I'm assuming it just connects directly to the ISA bus. So rather than having another card, it just sort of connects that way, which is sort of interesting. All right, so I'm going to just try this thing out, get the software set up, and see how it actually works. Now, the seller told me that it kind of, sort of, mostly, sometimes, definitely doesn't work, but sometimes does, <laughs> sort of thing, right? Um, obviously, they're going to want to make it sound like there's some hope for the card, but um, they did tell me that there, were, there was quite often garbled sound effects. Um, they also noted that there were memory allocation errors quite often that were, were coming up, so... Um, the good thing is that it does seem like the card is detected. It does sort of work. It plays sound sometimes. So at least that gives me some shimmer of hope that <laughs> it is repairable. So we'll go with that. We'll hang on to that hope. Um, but I have the uh, 386 system I repaired recently here on the uh, test bench. So I'm going to use that. It's just got a, an I.O. card here with an SD card uh, connected. And I've got an ATI uh, Mach 32 video card here. Pretty simple setup. Pretty appropriate as well for a card that was made in 1993. I know that these things can be a little bit speed sensitive, so I didn't want to use anything too new, but I think a, uh, a late 386 system like this should be just fine for, uh, for testing it out. Ah, the satisfying crunch of inserting an ISA card. So one thing that's a little flaky here though is this uh, line out jack. It's really, really loose, and I think I might have to replace that at some point. So when it comes to the software side of the Gravis Ultrasound, oh man, I don't even know where to begin. I'm going to try to hold myself back from ranting too much about it, but I probably wasted an hour and a half of my life that I'll just never get back. My first mistake was that I grabbed what I thought were a recent set of install disks, but it turned out to be much older than I thought it was, and it was super buggy. I could not get the card to initialize or work. It was just throwing errors left, right, and center, and I was pretty frustrated, especially considering that I didn't even know if the card worked properly at all. In the end, I did find the 4.11 software, which was the newest one out there, and it was a lot better, but it was still a bit flaky, especially the installer. I mean, it was throwing all kinds of weird errors. Like, for example, it would ask you to specify your Windows directory. It says leave it blank if you don't have Windows, which I did, and then it throws an error because you left the field blank. I mean, stuff like that, there's just not really any excuse for. And even some of the tests, like the DMA1 test that, uh, that it runs uh, once it's trying to set up the, the hardware, it fails every single time. And I didn't know that until I started doing some, some digging. And even though that DMA is free and working fine, the installer is just always going to lead you down that rabbit hole of thinking that it didn't work. So stuff like that is just really frustrating. And then even after you know all of that's done and it you know modifies your autoexec.bat for you, certain things still don't work on the card. Like for example, the MIDI patch files, they just don't load properly with the way it installs. So in the end, I had to do some tweaks there to get that to work also. But anyway, enough of that rant and negativity. Let's see if we can actually get some MIDI music to work. And wow, yeah, it's actually working. So, so far so good. This is just a simple MIDI file, which is a single instrument of banjo. So I'm going to try another file, something a little more complex with some more instruments in it, and see how this one does. Oh man, wow. Yeah. <laughs> that was sort of short-lived, that does not sound good. So yeah, there's definitely something quite wrong there. It got real garbled, almost like it went in super slow motion all of a sudden. But it's interesting that it did work for a while before this sort of thing started. But it's almost like it degrades into this state because, yeah, now that it's 
going into this garbled mess. It just seems to be stuck here, like I can't get clear sound at all anymore. Oh man, that's about all my ears can take of that. So let's try a game instead. I'm gonna run Jazz Jackrabbit. Uh, Jazz is known to be a game that uh, runs actually really well with the Gravis Ultra sound and has very good support for it. So if anything's a good test, I certainly would say this game is. But yeah, I'm not hearing any music at all, so that's a little bit disappointing. But oh, look, uh, yeah, there's some digital audio playing here. It's a little crackly, not very clear, but it does seem to be working, which is interesting. Oh, there it goes. Looks like it crashed totally. So PSM load error 2 in song 0.psm. So definitely something audio related, unfortunately. Not a very good sign. I'm going to try to run the game again, just in case. Oh, that's too bad. It actually sounded like it was going to work. Um, but again, it, it sort of worked for only about two or three seconds before it just degraded to that garbled mess again. So interesting that it can work. It's just doesn't seem to be able to maintain that for some reason. But yeah, I mean, it sounds like the digital audio is pretty badly distorted as well. But the music definitely sounds like the pitch is completely wrong, like it's played playing way too slow or something along those lines. So I'm wondering if this could be some kind of a timing issue or something like that. So the DRAM that's in the system is pretty critical. Although it's you know primarily used for sample storage or patch storage, my understanding is that the GF1 chip actually does use some of that DRAM for more important purposes as well. So there is a utility called Gus DRAM available that'll actually let you test the RAM in the system. It'll tell you if the bank configuration is good and then it'll basically just do some stability tests to see if it can read and write without failures. But um, every single time I run this thing, it literally fails within a millisecond. Like it tests just a very small amount of RAM before it fails. I'd be surprised if it was the DRAM chips, just because the seller probably would have identified that, especially since they had all kinds of spares available. I might try um, to change them out anyway. I do have some other chips and some various video cards that I have. I can at least, you know, do a quick test, see if it if it makes a difference. But um, yeah, definitely not a good sign, that's for sure. All right, so where do we go from here? So I think. We thoroughly tested this and we can pretty comfortably say it's broken. <laughs> you do always sort of hold out hope, you know, maybe, you know, maybe you're gonna try and it works just fine. Maybe it was just some weird incompatibility in the seller system or something, but no, this thing really is broken. I did actually try um, different DRAM chips. I replaced uh, these two here for the, uh, the Oki chips that uh, the seller provided. And I did have some Mitsubishi ones as well from a video card. They both seem to be detected just fine in Gus DRAM, but um, it doesn't change the behavior whatsoever. It fails the test almost immediately. So as I feared, I don't think it's the DRAM, it's something else. Um, my understanding is the GF1 is kind of like the memory controller for the DRAM, so um, it's possible the GF1's bad. I don't know, I'm kind of hoping not because I don't know how difficult it's gonna be to find a replacement of one of those. But definitely the best thing to start with here, I think, is just to give the card a really, really thorough cleaning with isopropyl alcohol. Try to get all the pin headers, all of the jumpers. I want to make sure that, um, you know, they're all very solidly working. I'm going to clean every socket. Anything that's socketed on here is going to come out, including the GF1, the lattice chip here. If I'm really lucky, it could just be that one of the pins on the GF1 might be a little corroded. Maybe it's not making good contact as the, the card warms up, it doesn't work too well anymore. Who knows, right? Could be something simple like that. Oh, also when I was inspecting this, I just wanted to mention, I'm not sure if you can see that here, but this Texas Instruments uh, IC down here does look like it was actually replaced at some point. I'm not sure if you can see that, but there are blobs of solder coming up on the legs there. So that's interesting as well. But anyway, let's get this thing cleaned out.
so unfortunately all that work cleaning the car did pretty much nothing at all. But I started poking and prodding it all over with some MIDI playing in the background, and to my surprise, when I touched certain areas around the GF1, it would suddenly start working or sound different. And at first I thought it was just the socket, but it really wasn't consistent when I put pressure on it. That's when I realized it was actually the side of my thumb that was touching the crystal oscillator and that would cause it to spring back to life. So touching it seems to work very consistently, but if I try to put pressure on it with something insulated, like my toothbrush for example, it doesn't seem to do anything at all, so I don't think it's a bad solder joint or anything. I wanted to see if grounding it made a difference, so I took my extractor tool here and I touched one end of it to the crystal and one end of it to the motherboard tray, and amazingly it started working. So. Normally you shouldn't need to ground one of these things, but it sounds like either grounding it or touching it changes something about it electrically that causes it to start out putting a good clock signal for the GF1 again. So I'm definitely going to have to look more closely at this crystal here. So I broke out my oscilloscope to see what the clock signal and frequency looks like. The GF1's crystal should output 19.768 MHz, but I'm not getting anything at all here. I'm just going to check the uh, scope really quick on the uh, CPU to see if it um, gives me anything here. And yeah, you can see I get a pretty solid 40 MHz wave, so no problem there. I think the scope is fine. But yeah, the every single time I make any contact with the probe to the pins of the crystal or the pin on the GF1 that connects to the crystal, it just stops working completely. You can hear the what you know distorted sound there is just cut out totally. So I think this crystal is totally bad and needs to be replaced. So I'll talk more a little bit about finding a replacement crystal for this thing, which is actually not nearly as easy as I thought it was going to be. But let's try this totally legit repair in the meantime here. I'm going to literally just scotch tape a bodge wire that grounds the crystal can, and I really want to see if it works reliably like this. And like magic, the Gravis ultrasound is now working beautifully. I only have to keep a bodge wire scotch tape to the crystal can, but hey, <laughs> there's probably people out there who would be satisfied with this as a permanent fix. But, um, you know, I had actually considered soldering up a ground lead to the can, but I mean, that's really just a crude workaround. There's definitely something very wrong with the crystal and it really needs to be replaced. MIDI music as well sounds great, no problems there. And as you can see, the Gus DRAM utility also passes every single time. So really good, and I think we've definitely identified the problem here. So after figuring out that the crystal was bad, I thought, hey, you know, quick desoldering job, throw a new one in, and away you go. But unfortunately, I didn't realize that 19.7568 MHz is actually a very uncommon crystal frequency, and it's not something that's readily available anywhere. It looks like it's not an active part at any of the usual component sellers, including DigiKey and Mouser. So unless you can find some new old stock somewhere, it's very, very difficult to find one of these. I had to place an order anyway at DigiKey for some other stuff, so I picked up a couple just to try out. They're only about a dollar each, so I figured why not. They're not exactly the same frequency, but they are pretty close. So I found one that was 20 megahertz. That's about 0.2 megahertz too fast. But I also found this other one here, and it's 19.6608 megahertz, about as close as you can get, just 0.08 megahertz too slow. Again, it's really close, but not exactly the same. And when you're dealing with audio equipment, timing can be very important. You're dealing with sample rates and things like that. So interestingly, right after I bought these close but not exact crystals, I was sharing my experiences on Twitter, and somebody named Ian mentioned that he had a whole bunch of them with the correct value. He was also doing a Gus repair about a year ago and managed to find some online, I guess when they were a little bit easier to find. And the seller he bought them from had a minimum order quantity, so he wound up with like a whole bunch of them. And he very generously offered to send me one. So thanks very much, Ian. I really appreciate it. And yeah, you gotta love the retro PC community. So many awesome and helpful people out there. And uh, being in Canada, it might be a week or two before it arrives in the mail. But in the meantime, I'm still going to replace this with one of the ones I bought just to see if it works. I'm very curious what will happen. And when I get the proper one, I'll definitely swap it out again so that it is the correct value. So I'm just going to add a little bit of extra fresh solder on top of what's there. The card's already really clean, so I don't need to scrub it down or anything. But this usually makes it a little easier to remove. And I'm just going to use my desoldering gun. Should make quick work of this. And there it is there. So you can see it's made by a company called the Clip Tech. And the part number is ECX1689, 19.7568 megahertz. 
And the holes were pretty clean, but I'm just going to use some uh, braided copper here, some wick, just to uh, clean them up a little bit. So here's the new crystal here. I decided to go for the 19.66 megahertz one. It was the uh, the closest of the two, so hopefully it'll work out okay. The dimensions are exactly the same, and it fits perfectly in there. I'm just going to put a little bit of tape on it just to hold it in place while I solder it here. And there you have it. I think it looks pretty good. It looks like the original and you'd never know that was replaced. So that's perfect. So now that I've got it back on the test bench here, you can see we've got a frequency. So that's exactly what we should see. The, uh, the number is jumping around a little bit, anywhere between 19.6 and 19.8, but it could just be the accuracy of my scope here. But that looks like a nice solid waveform and I'm quite happy with that. Let's see if it actually works now. So sounds pretty good to me. I mean, even though the crystal's not quite right to my untrained ears, it sounds quite good. No more garbled audio or cutting out and everything seems nice and stable now. So Murphy's Law, of course, less than 24 hours after I replaced the crystal, the one Ian sent me arrived in the mail, so way earlier than expected. And as you can see here, this is actually the perfect replacement, the exact same Ecliptek branded crystal part as the original. And even though the 19.6 megahertz one seems to work, it would really bug me not having the correct one. So I'm really happy to get this original part instead. Ian also sent me this nice note wishing me luck. So thanks again, Ian. I really appreciate it. So the Ecliptek replacement seemed okay at first, but I started getting some weird flakiness from the card again, unfortunately. Not nearly as bad as with the original crystal, but the symptoms were basically the same. I would get garbled and distorted playback and things like that. It just didn't happen as frequently. But for some reason, one of the crystal pins doesn't seem to output a clock signal. I'm not sure if that's normal because the 19.66 MHz one did on both. But again, if I touch the can or the pins, it causes the clock signal to cut in and out. It just seems way more sensitive and temperamental than it should be. It's really too bad, but I mean, that's the way it goes with these old components sometimes. New old stock crystals like this could be 30 plus years old for all I know. So who knows what kind of shelf life is really expected from them. But yeah, it's really too bad, but it looks like I'll have to settle for the 19.66 megahertz crystal in the end after all. But thankfully, it seems to be close enough that the card works just fine with it. So we'll just go with that. So with the 19.66 MHz crystal back in the card, it's now nice and stable again and working great. So it's time to upgrade the RAM. So it's not surprising that the seller didn't have all the chips in here. I mean, the card was so unstable before adding more RAM probably just made it worse. But um, now that uh, it's running great, I'm going to get the full one megabyte installed here. As you can see, all four banks were detected correctly, and this time the tests are all running just fine. So now with the full one megabyte installed, I can finally enjoy the full potential of the Gravis ultrasound. All right, so that's it. I think we can call this thing fixed. I must admit there was a point there I was a bit worried I made a big mistake buying this card, but I persevered, and in the end, I'm really glad I stuck with it because it turned out to be a pretty simple fix. I finally have a working Gravis ultrasound, and I didn't have to shell out a huge amount of money to get one, which is the best part. I never owned one of these cards back in the day, but I always wanted to try one and see what it was capable of, and really just to explore the very different and interesting sound experience it provides. So hopefully I'll be able to do some more videos with it and do some recordings and things like that in the future. So that's it for today. Thanks very much for watching. And as always, if you'd like to see more retro content like this, please be sure to like and subscribe. Thanks again.